God, you truly are good. And God, what a privilege, is, a privilege it is today to say thank you to you, Lord God. It should be a daily occurrence, but this weekend's been a set, by, set aside by our government, Lord God, to give thanks to God Almighty for the abundance that you bless us with, Lord. God, I know this has been a unique year in many, many ways, Lord God. Things that we are doing that we had never planned on doing, restrictions and so on and so forth. But Lord, I thank you that you're still on the throne. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, that you are good. In spite of everything that's going on, Lord God, our convenience may be interrupted, but God, you are never interrupted. Your grace, your mercy is never interrupted, Lord God. And Lord, I thank you that today that we are able to celebrate that. We're able to celebrate the goodness, Lord Jesus, that you blessed us with. That you died on the cross for each and every one of us. That your blood was shed for our salvation so that we would not have to go to hell. That we would not have to bear your punishment, Father God, but so that we could experience life and life more abundantly. Lord Jesus, your body was broken for us so that we might be made whole. That we might be made wholeness and not healing, even in the house today, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we partake of these elements, as we partake of the bread and the juice today. Lord, I thank you for your power and your might just to flow through us, your grace and your mercy and your and your power, Lord God, as we partake of this by faith, Lord God. I thank you that your spirit of life is inside of us giving us strength, giving us health, giving us goodness of life, Lord. Even as your word said, that our youth is renewed like eagles, Lord. We thank you for it now. So let's just partake of this. The priest of bread, Jesus said this on the night that he was passed away as he, just before he was put to the cross, he said to his disciples, take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. And in the same manner, he took the cup of redemption. It was a special cup. In those days they had four cups during Passover. And the third cup was the cup of redemption. A cup that would redeem. And Jesus picked that cup up. And he said, that's me. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That means we have a brand new covenant. A renewed covenant. Actually, Hebrew says a renewed covenant. In other words, the old was good up to that point. But there was something new about this new covenant. It was the blood of Jesus that finalized it all. You notice that we don't have altars here except for where we kneel down, where we sacrifice cows and cat doves and all cattle and so on and so forth. We don't do that because Jesus was the final sacrifice. Amen? We don't need to do that anymore. In Him we are free. In Him we've been forgiven. And if you're struggling today with sin in your life, you just, as you partake of it, say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that through your blood I'm forgiven. There, you don't have to do anything to earn it. It's yours for the taking. It's free, church. It's the most, the, the best news that the world's ever heard. That's why it's called the good news. The good news. So maybe you're struggling today. Maybe you're under a load of sin and guilt. But Jesus already paid for that. So don't be a martyr. Don't be a martyr. And I say, well, that's just me. No, it's not. Jesus took care of it. Can you just release it to the Lord? So, Lord, take my guilt. Take my shame. Can you do that? If that's you. I feel like somebody is here that's really under a load of guilt and shame. And the Lord said, don't. Because I've taken care of it. I've taken care of it. My blood has washed it away. And that's why we do this. Jesus said, I made a new covenant with you. You don't have to sacrifice for it. You don't have to give for it. You don't have to do anything for it. All you have to do is receive it by faith. So Lord, I thank you. Oh. Lord, we just thank you for that blood that was shed for, for me. For the people in this room. For the people that are watching by, by, by tape, Lord God, by live stream. People of this world, even the ones that don't realize it, Lord God, you died for them too. You, your blood was shed for them. 
And today, we accept that once again, Lord God, we remind ourselves of the great gift of salvation that was given to us. And we remind ourselves by taking this juice that resembles your blood, but it also resembles your joy that you want to release in our lives because we've been forgiven. Let's partake. Let's just sing that song one more time. God is so good. God, you're so seated. We're just going to switch the service up a little bit today, but this is my husband Gary and I'm Joan and we're the King's kids. <laughs> well, our last name is King, how about that? You're the King's kids too. <laughs> Did you know we are all family here? And we sometimes have guests, and the first time they're here, they're our guests. But the next time they're here, we call them family. Yay. And Gary and I host the new people that come through the doors. And this morning, if you're new, I would love it if you would sign a Connect card. They're on the backs of the chairs in front of you. You'll see them. And if you would write out a Connect card, and then... I can keep track of you and can find you, especially, I talked to some people this morning, Bonnie, that are interested in Seniors Connect. And so I had them fill out a couple cards for you. And then I talked to someone else that knows how to lead music and is interested in Seniors Connect also. So wouldn't that be amazing, Bonnie? A person who loves to lead hymns. So for your hymn sing night, that would be extraordinary. So we do have guests here this morning. Thank you for coming. Like I said, I'd like to meet with you back at the welcome table afterwards. We had to twist their arm to make them say they were uh, seniors, but they finally did. It's very good. It's all about hearing from the Lord, and uh, we all need that in the days we live. So, so come. That's on uh, Wednesday nights. So, uh, tonight there's no youth because of uh, Thanksgiving this weekend. So they're going to take a little break and probably be eating or doing something at home, right? And uh, 
on uh, October 17th, there's a Just Open Door Hospitality Seminar. Uh, Sherry Legault is putting that on. And anybody that's interested in hospitality and serving in the church, she would sure love to see you at that meeting, okay? So t uh, take part of that's October 17th, okay? That'd be next Saturday probably, right? Yeah, or this Saturday, yeah. And then on October 23rd, well, I guess on the 25th, Steve Holstrom is going to be here at this church now. I read his book, and man, oh man, did it ever give my mind a real bending, I'll tell you. So, if you're interested about the kingdom of God and, and uh, how he thinks about it, this is going to be a Sunday for you. So, make sure you come for that. It's going to be awesome. So, anyway, happy Thanksgiving. Bless you. And happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> All right. As you know, this we're going to do things a little different. Isn't that what Gary and Jones said this morning? Yeah. All right. We're going to have a sermon first, and then offering a little later on, because after all, it is Thanksgiving today. It's amazing, you know, when you think about 18 years. When you're, um, I remember back when I was. Uh, way back when I was 18 years old, I think, how did I ever get here because it took so long? <laughs> now 18 years, it's just like, <laughs> the older you get, it seems like, right? Anyways, that's just life itself. Let's just pray. Let's ask the Lord just for his guidance here this morning in, my, in the word that he's put in my heart. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, your word is good. <laughs> your word is full of life. Us, is able to touch us deeply, able to challenge us where we're at, able to correct us, able to stir us on, able to put hope inside of us, and all of that in the midst of your loving hand upon our lives, Lord God. Because God, you do not condemn, but you do convict so that we may be convinced of the truth. And so, therefore, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our midst as I minister your word, Lord. Father, not my word, your word, as we come under your Lordship. And so, Lord, may I be a steward of your word this morning, touching each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to share a message that um, God put in my heart yesterday, all week I've been pondering on this. And it's a message that I, it's a revelation that I, you kind of know a little bit about, but it's like, it's, it's, to me it's, it's fresh, it's new, and yet it's exciting. And it's called the principle of thanksgiving. As I was preparing this yesterday, all of a sudden the, the, the thought of the principle of thanksgiving kept running through my heart. And so when I went home last night after I got the sermon already, Rose and I just sat down. I'll give credit to my wife. And so she, so she said, so what you're trying to say is, is that that is not only a hard attitude of gratitude, but it's also reflected in our actions. And I thought, yeah. And so it's amazing how that when you sometimes share with people, especially my wife, I don't tell her all the sermons ahead of time. And... Uh, but I do share with her sometimes the, the thoughts, what I have in my heart, and I'm not quite getting it. And sometimes you need somebody else to come alongside of me. So I just give honor to my wife here this morning to help me just to put this together over here. But that's what the whole sermon is going to be about. That the principle of thanksgiving is this. It's not only a heart attitude, and we know that. We, it's easy to say, I thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It, it's easy to share and to say all of that, right? But it's a whole other thing to, to, to put it in an action, some kind of an action. And that's my heart. And that's what I see in the Word of God. That when we are truly thankful, be it being thanksgiving, that when we are truly thankful, there will be an action connected to it of some sort. Let's go to Psalm 100. Because I think this is what David is trying to say. We're going we're gonna to look at Psalm 100 and we'll come back to it a couple of times. We're going to finish it. We're going to finish up with it. Psalm 100 is a psalm by David. 
And most of us know this, most of us have heard this before, maybe you don't, but I'm going to read a New King James Version, and it says, and it's on the screen there for you to, look, to follow along with me. It says, make a joyful shout to, all, to the Lord, all you lands. A joyful shout literally means be loud about it. Don't be timid, don't be shy, right? So loud music is not from the devil, as some people may think. But some loud music sometimes hurts our ears. All right, that's a whole different ball game. So we're careful about the noise level, all right? So we don't have decimal levels of 200, whatever, because it'll blow your ears out. We don't want that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, David is saying, hey, be excited about the Lord. And, and don't be timid and shy about it. That's what this is all about. Then it says, serve the Lord with madness. Is that what it says? It says to serve the Lord with gladness. In other words, be excited about it. Be happy about it. Right? Show some joy. Come before his presence with singing. That's what we did this morning. Know that the Lord, he is God. He is God. It is he who made us. Let's say this together. It is he who made us. Who made us? God. And not we ourselves. We are his people. Whose people are we? God's. And the sheep of his pasture. Whose pasture? This is key to understanding what we're going to be talking about this morning. It's his pasture. And because of that, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, or enter his gate with thanksgiving in your heart, and to his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Why? Verse 5, for the Lord is good. Did we not sing about that this morning? Do you sense the presence of God in there on that this morning? God is so good. It was a song for this morning. God, you're so good. It's good for us to be reminded of that once in a while. And then to ponder on, where is God's goodness in my life? And so that's why we have a day like Thanksgiving. In 1957, January 31st, 1957, our government decided to say, we're going to book, we're going to put uh, the, uh, the, our Thanksgiving day on the 2nd, Monday of, of October every year. And it hasn't changed. And it says to give, give thanks to God Almighty. Those are exact wording. Not just any God. God Almighty. And even though we see within government circles sometimes a distancing from the Lord Jesus Christ, that is still on the books. Isn't that awesome? That we can do that today. We are blessed to do it today. But not just today. We need to do it all the time. For his mercy is everlasting and a truth who endures his truth or his word or his principles endure to how many generations? Oh. Right from the beginning of generations till the end of generations on the earth, God's principles do not change. Amen. If we understand that, we would have less trouble with trying to figure out the word of God. Because his principles do not change. Morals, our morals in society may change, but God's word does not change. It stays the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't change. So guess who's going to be changing? <laughs> I am going to be changing. My heart has to change. And sometimes we all carry things in our heart. We're influenced by circumstances, situations, and say, is that so? Where do we go for our bearings? Where do we go for the plumb line? Back to the word of God. I was reading a study the other day, and um, I, I get these magazines, I was reading a study the other day, that even today, uh, in today's age, so many Christians' moral bearing have just gone sideways. And the same ones that their moral bearings have gone sideways are the same ones that hardly ever read the Word of God. Might there be a correlation? I believe there is. Church, do not stop reading the Word of God. Do not stop pondering on it because that's going to give you success in life. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, for personally, um, Thanksgiving is a daily occurrence. When I do my devotions in the morning, one of the first things I write down, or one of the first things I do, I say, Lord, I thank you for. And then I go, blah, 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 blah. So this morning, for instance, I wrote down, Lord, I give you thanks for yesterday. Lord, I thank you for the message that you put on my heart because I struggled this last week. In fact, on Thursday, I thought it was a waste of my day because I didn't get anywhere. 
<laughs> Anybody ever been there? There, there, the beginning at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, and I'm thinking, what did I do? It didn't mean that I sat around behind my desk and just twiddled my thumb. I mean, I was busy, but I felt, Lord, I didn't feel that productive. But I, that's okay. So I just felt in my heart, God's going to give it to me on Saturday. So I did. Took about Friday's off. Friday's my day off, so I took it off. I came to the office Friday, Saturday morning, and it just it just flowed. See, God is good, right? I said, I said so this morning. I said, Lord, I just want to say thank you for yesterday, because God, I'm not that smart, but Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that's here today, that's helping me, right? Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit that gives you wisdom? Gives you understanding. He's the spirit of wisdom. That's what Proverbs says. Paul talks about it. Draw on it. And so that he help you. He wants to help you all the time. So if nothing else, that's a good thing to say thank you to the Lord for, right? And so I can always find something to give thanks for. In fact, the action is very healthy. It's a very healthy attitude. As most people know, that, that, that to have an attitude of gratitude is healthy for your soul. It benefits you and it shifts things in your heart. So the word benefit and shift are key words this morning okay. in the message. In fact, people who are grateful have greater resilience to go through challenges that they face during the day, even hard times. People that are thankful have much greater resilience to be able to come out on a positive note and on a negative note when they go through hard times. Right. It's a proven fact. And so therefore the principle of thanksgiving is not only a hard attitude of gratitude, but it ref it's reflected also by our actions. So let's have a look at some scriptures that specifically talk about a heart attitude of gratitude reflected by our actions. And these are just some scriptures. There's so many of them in the Bible. But I chose these just for today. First of all, there's an encouragement to give thanks to God often. And most of these are by David, not all of them, but King David. Because he was a man who loved to praise God, who loved to give thanks to God. And that's why the Psalms are just loaded with his Psalms. Not all the Psalms are from David, but many of them are. The, the, the majority of them are. And it didn't matter what mood he was in. He was a moody guy too. He's a warrior, but he was also a moody guy. Him and I would go really well together because he would have tears and then he'd be strong, right? Why? Because of his hope and heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his God. He loved his God. So he could, be, he could be a sobbing guy one moment and just frustrated on the floor before the Lord worshiping and the next moment he was fighting for his life. And so he says in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 verse 34, it's one of the Psalms, Oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And if you keep reading on the Psalm, really the, or the, 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 in 2 Chronicles, it's an encouragement to give thanks to God often. Secondly, David also put worship teams together. In 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1 through 4, he put worship teams together to give thanks with prophetic songs. Not just any song, but prophetic songs. Where people, where people come into the presence of God and they would just sing by the Spirit of God. They didn't have tongues back in those days, but they would sense the Holy Spirit descending upon them as they got into the presence of God. And just began to worship God and make up the words as the Lord put them in their heart. And you can do that in your own pace. Sometimes it happens on the stage over here. Many times I'm in the front row. The worship team is there singing their song. I'm singing my song. Nothing against the worship leaders. Why? Because God moves on my heart. And I sense his spirit moving. And so he said, Moreover, David and the, captain, David and the captains of the army, army separated for the service some of the sons of Asap. Asaph, six in the direction of their father uh, Jeduthun, who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. Wow. wow. So it's actually scriptural for us to do that. Giving thanks to God at a local church. David said in Psalm 35 verse 18, I will give you thanks in the great assembly. Not just by himself, but I will give you thanks in the great assembly. In other words, there are a lot of people gathered together. I will praise him amongst many people. He's trying to repeat himself. Don't, get, don't miss this, he said. Right. As he's going to church, and, and, and it's good for you singing by yourself, but there's something also, there's something good about giving thanks in the midst of when we gather together. Amen. There's a shift maybe. There's benefits to you that happen. 
And, and, and you, you begin to lift yourself, being, you can begin to feel yourself being lifted up. Maybe you come in here and you don't feel as good. You, don't, you feel down a little bit. Or you, you had a bad week this week. And that's okay. You have got mountaintops and you got valleys and everything in between. It's okay. But you, let's walk out differently. Because we've been in the presence of God. Because the God's got a hope. But when we give him thanks, when we begin to praise him, something begins to shift in the atmosphere over us so that we can take his hope back home with us. Fourthly, giving thanks, ha! Giving thanks is the will of God. Wow. Isn't that something? Yeah. It's the will of God. For whose benefit? It's actually my, for my benefit. God's not up there, Wayne, if you don't give thanks. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. None of that stuff. <laughs> Giving thanks is for my benefit. Again, I'll show you that through scripture. That principle is right from the beginning of the Bible, right to the end, even into heaven. Amen. Wow. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, In everything give thanks. You don't have to give thanks for, every, for everything, but in everything. Yeah. Wow. In everything. In every, no matter what, you, what you're walking through, in everything, what does, what happens when you give thanks in everything? Something begins to shift and to change. Just think of Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas find themselves in prison. They were beat, they were whipped, they should, Paul shouldn't have been beat like that, he was a Roman citizen. I'm not sure why he got beat. Other places he said, whoa, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm not sure why it happened, why, why he got beat this time. But they were black and blue. I mean, they had blood flowing through their back. And they were thrown into the, most, the, the inner prison. In other words, the darkest place and the hardest place. Should he be giving thanks to God for this stuff? Your emotions probably tell you no. Yeah. Your emotions tell you, may, may tell you, God, you asked me to go on a mission field. And now this. Like, what's this? I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. <laughs> but Paul and Silas, what did they do? They begin to sing worship and hymns and praise him. The atmosphere began to shift and change. It was for their benefit. So that freedom came and a jailer's household got saved. Wow. And so therefore the book of Philippians, if you want some, you want to, you want to stir yourself in joy, the book of Philippians is all about joy. It's all about joy. Because the this, this, this city was birthed out of joy. That church was birthed out of joy. Sorry, not the city. And that's why we see in the fifth thing, giving thanks, shift things in the heavenlies. And you see that throughout the Word of God. You look at the book of Revelation, and it reveals to us that there's much thanksgiving in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4, as the elders were giving thanks, they laid down their crowns. They were giving thanks. They laid down their crowns before Jesus, and there was a shift in the heavenlies. And all of a sudden, the seals began to open. Because it says, who's worthy to open this seal? And people are looking around. And all of a sudden, if you go to, when you go to chapter 5, all of a sudden, Jesus says, the Lamb of God is able to open the seal. Thanksgiving began to shift and open things up. Book of Revelation, uh, chapter 11, it's the same thing. Thunders and lightnings and so on and so forth in the heavenlies. And all of a sudden, there are shifts happening. Acts chapter 16, as I said already, there was a shift happening for Paul and Silas' benefit. And John, in 2 Chronicles 20, you remember Joseph at, who was, had an army against him, coming against him, was railing against God. And what did the prophetic word come forth? He says, Jehoshaphat, put the worshippers in, in front of the army and worship towards yourself, towards the, uh, uh, towards the enemy. Three nations were coming against them. They were outnumbered and how many times. There's no way in the natural that they could overcome them. But worship and thanksgiving to the Lord. What did it do? The Bible says as soon as they began to praise, the Lord set an ambush against all three nations. They began to do infighting and by the time they got there, all they had to do is recover the spoil. Wow. What's thanksgiving and praise for? Whose benefit? It's for my benefit and it shifts things around us. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Isn't this good? Yeah. Now let's keep going. So this is not just, this principle is not just in the, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but it's also in the millennial. A thousand years. I'd never seen this before. And there's a couple of things that I want to share from you, uh, share to you uh, out of this, and you'll like this. 
In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 through 19, we find millennial that it talks about quite a bit. It's hidden within the scripture, especially in the Old Testament. It talks about it in the book, of the Revelation chapter 20, 19 or 20, I believe it is, where Jesus takes, takes, uh, takes care of the enemy. He binds him for the Antichrist for a thousand years. And that's what we call the millennial age. And Jesus reigns for a thousand years. Pardon? On earth, yeah. On earth. So it says after that war, after Jesus takes care of these guys, when we come down, as if, if we're there, then if we're in heaven, and we come down with him, uh, with him in white robes on our horses, and to lead, and to lead him, in, and to lead us in battle against the enemies that come against Jerusalem. And so Zechariah picks up on this in for chapter 4, verse 16 through 19. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations after that war, which came against Jerusalem, they shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh. Now the Feast of Tabernacles we just finished. It was October the 3rd to the 9th or the 10th. The 8th day is the 10th. It's a new start of the new year. It's a finish of the fall feast, that, uh, except for the one, the Feast of Light in December, but the three fall feasts in the, in the fall. And it correlates with our thanksgiving. Amazing. Wow. Sometimes it falls on top of it. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is where the nation of Israel has a number of purposes. Number one, first of all, it is for the nation of Israel to thank the Lord for the freedom that he gave the nation of Israel from the Egyptians. Number one. And so they honored the Lord uh, with that, and so they have what they call a Sukkot. Uh, it's called Sukkot, but they, have a, they have a Sukkah, is what it is. A little tent that is open all the way around, like it would look like that they were in tents in the wilderness, to remind themselves of what God has done for them years ago for the Jewish people. It's celebrated all around the world by the Jews. Secondly, it's also a feast of harvest, a thanks for harvest. Of the harvest, the bountiful harvest that God has done. It's a very joyous occasion, very celebratory. But I believe also that the, it's going to take on another meaning. He doesn't say that, but, but I was pondering and I was, think, I was thinking, it's going to take a whole, uh, another, whole other meaning when Jesus comes and reigns because Jesus once again destroys all their enemies. Wow. And so during the millennial, I see from Scripture, just reading in between the lines, I believe it's not just from the, from the Egyptians, but also from the world itself. Because the Bible talks about that millennial age, that Jerusalem is going to be basically the focus of the world. Why do you think there is so much fight over Jerusalem right now? Why do you think there was so much fight when, when Trump moved uh, his, the head office of, the, of, of his country, of his... Um, uh, his what? The embassy. the embassy from wherever it, was, wherever it was in Jerusalem. Do you think there wouldn't be a fight for that? Yeah. Why? Because it's prophetically already showing this is what will happen. And Jesus will set up his dominion and his throne in Jerusalem. Yeah. This is what this is about. Now listen to this. So all nations... Uh, they're going to go up from year to year to worship the Lord. And it came to be, it shall be, that whichever of families of the earth do not come up. Everybody say, do not. No. Come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. On him there will be no rain. On them there will be no rain. That's not it yet. If the family of Egypt, they're used, just using Egypt as an example, will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. Guys, this is not, this is like, it's not a if. It's not if I feel like it. It is like, you're going to have to honor the Lord. And if not, there's consequences. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, there's got to be a representation of every nation in the world that's not going to have to come to Jerusalem to honor the King who is the Lord of hosts, who owns the earth. See, that's why I saw in David, Psalm 100, whose field are we in? His field. Whose earth? His earth. So during this thousand years, Zechariah sees ahead of time 
All nations are to keep the feast and come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. The Lord's expected, is expecting a representation of each family nation to honor him. Those nations who refuse to come will have economic disaster, drought and plagues as punishment. You think it's bad with COVID today? I think this is just small compared with some of these nations are going to be facing. I mean, there's nations around the earth that experience, have experienced all kinds of stuff. Right? But as Canadians, I don't think we've seen anything yet. If our nation decides not to honor the Lord. I pray our nation will. So the question then is, how will they worship the Lord? That's the question that was in the back of my mind. Whenever the people of Israel would come to Jerusalem, they had to have a tangible gift in the Old Testament of some sort in their hand to bless the Lord at the temple, to honor the Lord. A gift of thanksgiving to the Lord for his goodness. So it was not just worship with their words, it was also worship with their actions. As in bringing gifts to the house of God. We see this expectation of God during the millennial time also. The nations coming to Jerusalem are worshiping the Lord with a grateful heart. In fact, this is not the only place it talks about. A number of different places in the Bible it talks about. But Isaiah 60, the whole, the whole Isaiah 60 is about this whole fact. Which was written 2,700 years ago. Arise, you know the scripture, arise and shine for the light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And we use that for ourselves. Especially uh, darkness and great darkness is going to cover the earth. But my light will be seen upon you. It is, yes, we can use that as revelatory for each one of us. But it's actually, in, in, its, in, its, uh, in its inception, it was actually spoken to the nation of Israel to give them hope that better days are coming. Because Isaiah, Isaiah was pro prophesying doom and gloom because they wouldn't listen to God. They wouldn't honor him. And he said, but a day is coming when things are going to change. And so verse 5, it picks up now. Now the millennium has, millennial has started. And it says, Then you shall become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because of the abundance of the sea shall be returned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Wow. Where is Jesus sitting? In Jerusalem. On his throne. That's his headquarters. The nations are going to be bringing what? Wealth to Jerusalem every year. Verse 11, therefore, you gates shall be open continually. In other words, the gates of Jerusalem are going to be open all the time. Why? Because there's so much wealth that's coming their way. So much honor. So much thanksgiving. So much gratitude is going to come. They shall not be shut. They shall not be shut day or night that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in procession. Now verse 12. I think we read this in Zechariah 14. For the nations and kingdoms which will not serve you shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. Wow. Twice. See, the word of God is established in two, by two or three witnesses. Now, so how would they worship the Lord? With a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving, offering Annually, being offered annually. You see, the principle of thanksgiving is not just a heart attitude of gratitude. Lord, I'm so thankful. Like, I can sing about you. And all of that is good. That is like, I, I love worship, personally, myself. But what, what's the tangibility that you can bring to offer the Lord? What's something that you and I can bring to the Lord? What is expected of them? There is a, it's reflected also by our actions. What God has blessed you and I with. Because it's not ours to begin with. Right. We're stewards of what God has given to us. Yeah. Even though we have house titles, we have owned lands and so on and so forth. That's in the world situation over here. But really, according to God, we're stewards. We're not owners. We get to steward what we own. Now watch this. No thanksgiving gift. Our wealth to the Lord. Drought. Pestilence, a ruined nation over time. So I talked to Wood about the shift and benefit. No honor, no practical thanksgiving, and there will be a shift over the nation, but not to the good. Secondly, a thanksgiving gift when it was brought by the nations, 
The nation will be blessed. See, there's a shift again in the heavenlies over the nation. See, Thanksgiving is for our benefit. It was for their benefit so God could bless the nations. Something about Malachi that says he'll rebuke your devourer. Hmm. So then the question I had, Lord, what percentage? Oh, Wayne, now you're messing with us. But what percentage would, of wealth would those nations bring? What's the biblical principle throughout the Word of God? It's a tithe. I believe, it doesn't, but the, just looking at the biblical principles, I believe it will be in excess of 10% of its nation's the, uh, gross domestic profit. That's what I sense in my heart. Because it's biblical. We see it. We see it in Proverbs. We see it in Malachi. We see it, we actually see it throughout the Word of God. You see, why would God want to do that? Because we don't own it. It's His field. We are His people. He owns your wealth. He owns what you own. So how grateful are we as a nation? How grateful are we as a people? Lord, I worship you. God, you're so good. Yes, you are God. And we do see the benefits of that. All the blessings of God are mine. But I believe there's a little bit more to it than that. I believe there's an activation of God over our life in certain areas of our life that when we are truly thankful, when we begin to, when we begin to give back to Him with what He's blessed us with. Give and it shall be given unto you. Right? The, um, during prayer this morning, this is scripture to the ladies God. Philippians chapter 4. It says this. Paul said this to the Thessalonians, uh, to the Philippians. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once again for my necessity. In other words, the Philippians were thankful to God for, for what God had brought to the to. Uh, to the Philippians. So what they did, they sent wealth ahead. They sent gifts ahead, financial gifts to Paul to help him in the ministry. Not that I seek the gift, but the gift is connected to what he's about to say. But I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. There is a benefit when we give. There is a shift that begins to happen over our life when we give and sow into the kingdom of God. When we are thankful to the Lord, indeed I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. That's why God says he loves a cheerful giver. And then it says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's in that context. And you cannot take that out of context. That God is just going to supply your need just like that. He wants to, but there are principles involved. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. To how many generations? All generations. His truth and his principles to all generations. You can't just pull things out. You can't. It's well, you can, but you pay the consequences. <laughs> the nations who bring wealth as a thanksgiving offering understand that they are stewards of the land and not owners. That Jesus is king, the Lord of hosts over the earth. He owns it all. Hmm. So are we thankful people in Alberta and in Canada? Even in the midst of what's going on. It's not been a normal year. Have you noticed that? It's not been a normal year. And I think we're all, we're all aware of that. But in the midst of it, we ought to be thankful. We ought to be the most thankful people on the face of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Because God hasn't changed. We also know that we, that we are hidden in God through Christ Jesus. And that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus dwells within us. 
Do we realize that even though we own things, we are in fact stewards and not owners of this earth and its resources? It all belongs to the Lord. Do we bring tangible gifts of our economic resources to the house of God with a heart of gratitude? Look at Psalm 100 once again. Psalm 100, 1 through 5. It said, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you land. Serve the Lord with, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God, is he who has made us. Not we ourselves. We are his people. The sheep of his pasture. Do you notice the word his a couple of times there? Yeah. His pasture, his field, his earth. Therefore, we need to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name with words and actions. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth, his principles endure to some generations. Just the ones we want to pick out of the Bible. Uh-uh. All generations. Right from Adam right to the end of this age. So in how many ways can we give thanks to the Lord for his goodness? In so many ways. So many ways. But here are some practical ones. Make it a daily practice in giving thanks to our God for what he has provided for you and I. Secondly, make it a weekly practice in your local assembly and give thanks to God together. Make it a habitual practice to give a portion of your wealth to the Lord as a gift of worship. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. His principles do not change. Remember that we are stewards, not owners, and the Lord delights in blessing his people. Jesus is king and the Lord of hosts over the earth. Look at this, uh, this passage before. I had never seen this before, but I want to read Malachi chapter 8, the tithing passage. The whole emphasis of the book of Malachi is this. The people are asking God, what's the point of serving you? That's the point. And God comes back through Malachi and say, whoa, just back off for a minute here. I have loved you. And then he say, then the people say, well, what ways do have we loved you? And God begins to describe this. And then he begins to talk to him and says, you know why, what, why these things are happening? Why your nation is falling apart again? Because you're not doing these things right. You've walked away from the Lord. You've dishonored him so many different ways. If you go back, this is what's going to happen. And so this is really an encouragement for the nation of Israel to come back online and do things the way God has presented them to them so that the land will be blessed. Wow. That's why Malachi, uh, the nation, uh, that's why Malachi says to the... <laughs> To the nation of Israel, will a man rob God? Well, how can you rob someone? If, uh, uh, how can you say, God, have you robbed me if, if, you, if, he, um, <laughs> if, if, you, if he, if he, if he, if he owns it, or if you, if he doesn't own it? Yeah. Thank you, dear. How do we rob God? When we withhold, that place is rightfully His. We're not owners. We are stewards. We are stewards of the things that God has blessed us with on this earth. Yet you've robbed me. But I say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and of, not just tithe, tithe, the word Hebrew, lower tithe, literally means 10% of your income. Literally, you can look it up, no other way. 10%, we just put tithe. And offerings, in other words, more than that. Within a Jewish culture, most of them gave up to 30%. Different aspects of it. And because of that, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Sounds something similar to some of the passages that we've read in Isaiah and Zechariah. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, your local church, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of all. It's the only place in the Bible that says to try me. Wow. If I will not open you the windows of heaven. Wow. Did we talk about the benefit? But the shift? That's why I went to heaven. It's in heaven. What did the elders do when they were in heaven? In Revelation chapter 4. What did they do? They knelt before the Lord. And what did they do? They gave their crowns. It's in heaven. It's not just here on earth. It's in heaven. 
In heaven it happens. The millennial time it happens. It, need to ha it needs to happen here on earth. He said, try me now, says the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. I shift in the heavenly. That's what Zechariah says, donations that are going to, that are going to be blessed. Uh, guess what? There's going to be a blessing. Uh, those that are going to bring thanksgiving offerings to the Lord. Those nations are blessed. But those that withhold, there's also a shift. And those nations, if they don't stop, if they don't, if they don't come back and say, we're sorry, we, we repent. There's going to be ruin. Economically. Look at this. As I pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. The destroyer. The one who comes to pull away. That when you get a paycheck, it just seems like it flows out your pockets and nothing is left. But my wife and I have noticed that when we give 10%, or we give more than that actually. But when we give, the Lord rebukes the devourer. And we can do more with 90% with God than I can do with 100% without God. That's the principle. He's our rebuke to devour for his sake, so that he is, will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the divine fail to bear fruit in your field. By the way, you can find this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. Same thing. And all the nations will call you blessed. For you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Wow. So how can you say uh, you have robbed... How can God say you've robbed me? Because he owns it all, church. We are stewards of this earth and its resources. Stewards, not owners. Yes, in his world view, I own stuff. But in God's eyes, we're stewards. Because we're passing through. Amen. This is not our final destination. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you can't own anything. It doesn't mean you can't have the good things. It doesn't mean at all. God says, will you just trust me? And so all I'm asking you for me to for for you to steward the things that you have, I want you to bless me. I want you to give thanks to me. See, that's 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 God's will for our lives. In everything, give him thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and I. But it's not because God is so heavy handed. It's because he loves you and I enough to be straight with us and say, This is how it works. This is the principle. And so, when I look at this, let me just go back again, I missed one. So the principle of thanksgiving is not only in the heart attitude of gratitude, but it's also reflected in our actions. But in giving thanks from a grateful heart, we are blessed, and we are enriched. Wow. That's the principle of thanksgiving. Look at this over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let me just go back here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 and 11, Amplified Version. Paul says this to the Corinthian church. And God, who provides seed for the sower. Who provides seed for the sower? Where did it come from? It was already in the earth and before man came to the earth. So we're not that smart. It is already all the resources within the earth. So all the things that we own, all the things that we have, the cars that we drive, the houses that we have, are the resources from this earth. The food that we eat are the resources from this earth. It's like we're not that smart. We can, we can cultivate things up. We can mess with it a little bit. But where did it come from first? It was God's. We are stewards of that which God has blessed us with on this earth. And God who provides seed for the sower and bread for eating, who will also provide and multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruit of your righteousness. So as you're sowing, you're, not, you're increasing the fruit of right doing. Of righteousness. Right doing. Which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness, and charity. Huh. There's an activation. There's an action. 
It's not just a heart attitude. There is an action. That's what Paul said. You see, now, now we're in the New Testament. Verse 11, thus you will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you can be generous and your generosity as it is administered by us will bring forth thanksgiving to God. What's God's heart? He wants to bless you more and more and more and more and more and more. But there are principles that when we violate them, it's not going to work. The principles of a God are yea and amen. We don't mess with them. Well, you can. But you miss, you're going to miss out. You're going to pay the consequences. You see, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God's principles do not change. The principle of thanksgiving is the same in the Old Testament, the New Testament, today, in the millennium time, and in heaven. It doesn't change. I've given you a lot of scripture over here, so I only need two or three witnesses out of the Word of God. I've given you a lot more. And so what about a day like today? What about a day like today? What about a day like any day? Not just today. That's what Paul said. That's what David said. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that he is the Lord. He is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture, his pasture, his field, his earth. Therefore, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Not just with your words, but with your wealth. With those things that God has blessed us with. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Why? Because the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth, his principles endures not just for one generation, just not for my grandpa and grandma's generation who did all this stuff. Not just for my dad and mom's generation that did all this, but for my generation today that is alive today. So that we can, so that we can propagate, move forward, go to, so that it can continue on to the generations to come. So that God's goodness comes on the land. Amen. From a heart of thanksgiving. Do you know that our nation, I'm not sure if you knew this now, but Alberta has had one of the, the best years on record, I believe, when it comes to the agriculture sector. Did you know that? Not like that everywhere. Did you know that Alberta, the oil sands, and we've been praying for Alberta. Right? Did you know that the oil sands are, con are, are looking at uh, other, uh, other um, products out of bitumen that comes out of the earth? Energy efficient, or energy, or uh, sorry, green stuff. And there's one particular one that I can't remember what the name is anymore. But anyways, it, is, it, it could bring more finances into Alberta than what oil ever has brought into Alberta. Wow. I get excited when I hear stuff like that. Why? Because God wants to bless the land. He wants to bless the people. And when you and I, when the church begins to rise up and begins to do what God tells them to do, then the world will begin to take notice. There's going to be shifts that are happening. God's not looking to the world. He's looking to the church. Church, are you willing to buy into? Are you willing to be obedient to the Word of God? Because that's when shifts begin to take place. If we're not willing to do it, then don't ask the world to do it. We ought to be thankful. Especially on a day like today. When we see that principle right from... Look at Cain and Abel for instance. Why did Abel... <laughs> why did Abel smoke go up when his offering went up and Cain didn't? And why did God reject Cain? That's a whole different sermon in itself. But I'll give you this. It's right inside the Hebrew language itself. It because Cain gave them the first fruit. Abel. Uh, Abel gave the first fruit. Cain gave off the leftovers. What was left over? God, I've got this left over. In the process of time, if you look at it in the Hebrew language, it says when, every, when, when he paid all his debts, so or when he paid everything off, then he had this little bit left over. And finally he gave, yeah, okay God, here you go. His heart was not in it. 
Church, we see this principle right from Genesis all the way to the heaven. Book of Revelation 22 and everything in between. For that very reason, today I felt like that God is challenging us, not twisting anybody's arm. You need to do what you need to do. And so that's why we left the offering till the end. And I know some of you already given. Uh, you do the e-transfer. E but I'd like the ushers to come forward. And today what I want you to consider is to give an offering of thanksgiving to the Lord. Not just from your heart, but from your actions. To put action to your word. And not just to do it today, but if, you've, if this has been something that has, you've, not been done, you've not been doing, and you've been coming to church and for years and years and years, but the pocketbook's been closed. God blesses us, don't worry, but it's, it's not about more money for the church. That's not the issue. God's heart is to bless you. To shift things over your life. So that you are blessed, because that's God's heart. And so I felt yesterday to, to, shift the offer, to shift the service around and to give you an opportunity to sow into God's, into, as an as a offering of thanks. And if you don't have finances with you, you can do it throughout the week, by, even by e-transfer or maybe next week. But you say, I don't need to know what that is. The board doesn't need to know about it. Nobody needs to know about it. This is between you and God. But I believe I've shown in the principle of thanksgiving and that there's benefits to the giving to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see it throughout the Word of God. And so Lord, in your, in your um, in chairs in front of you there will be these uh, little offering envelopes or you can go to uh, Margaret at the Connect Hub after the service is done. You can mail it in if you're watching by live stream if you're part of our congregation. Or you can do e-transfer to info at onelifechurch.ca. It's not about the amount. It's about your heart. Put an action to the gratefulness that you have towards the life that God has blessed you with and the things that God has blessed you with as a steward, not an owner, but as a steward of the things that God's given you. So Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. You're touching our hearts and our lives, Lord. And Lord, we give this offering unto you, Lord God, saying, Lord, thank you for the things that you've blessed us with. Thank you, Lord God, we can live in a province like Alberta, in a country like Canada, where people are, cr are crying to move to, Lord God, because they recognize its prosperity and its blessing. And yes, Lord, some of us have more, some of us less. But in light of the world, Lord God, we are extremely blessed. We are extremely blessed, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord God, when we complain. When we complain, Lord God, because we think we don't have everything that our neighbor does. But Lord, our neighbor is not our standard. You are our standard. And so, Lord, today, we willingly, we cheerfully give you this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So ushers are going to come by and just receive the offering today.
stand up. Let's just maybe just raise our hands to the Lord. And just tell Him for a few moments how thankful you are of your salvation. Lord, we just thank you for your salvation. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness that we read about this morning, even as David, thousands of years ago, encouraged us to be joyful, to, 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 to shout for joy. Because you are so good, Lord. To come into your presence with thanksgiving in our heart, with praise upon our lips. God, you're not twisting anybody's arms. But Lord, you said, this is the will of God, to be thankful in everything, to be thankful. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So that you're able to pour blessing back on us. Our offering, our gifts coming before you as a sweet aroma, as a love offering. And you in return, Lord God, shifting your blessing, shifting things above us for our benefit. Where you rebuke the devourer over our lives and over our homes. So that your blessing is able to flow. So that we can be generous. So that we can be generous not just in the local body, but in our neighborhoods and the ministries that you touch us with, Lord. We thank you for that opportunity. Because God, we recognize you own it all. And we're your stewards. We're stewards, not just of the mysteries of God, but we're also stewards of that which you've placed in our hands. And we thank you for that. That you've given us that responsibility. Help us, Lord, to steward things well in life for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you. If you need prayer, there will be people up front here. We'd love to pray with you.